We move on into uh, self-control of the saints. This is the last of the fruit of the spirits. Of course, you know, like I said, we've got all the rest of the year to go through as far as the tools that God gives to us to live the Christian life. We come to this. It is the last of the fruit of the spirits. We did gentleness last week, and we're doing self-control this week. This self-control may be the last, but it is not the least of the fruit of the Spirit. I didn't say one of the fruits. It is part of the fruit of the Spirit. It is absolutely essential for us to grab a hold of this concept of self-control. I, I, when I came to gentleness and self-control, I thought, well, maybe I combine those together. I think I mentioned that last week. I combine those together. And then I got into the gentleness, and oh my goodness, I could probably teach out of that for another couple of weeks. And then I went into self-control, and I thought, well, you know, at least it's going to be small. And then I got into it, and oh my goodness, there's less, oh, huge, it is huge. This self-control, I think as we go through this, you'll see how powerful it is for us to understand it in our own lives. This is a fruit of the Spirit, which means the Holy Spirit brings it to us. We have this inside of us as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. You have the ability to have self-control empowered by the Spirit of the living God that wants to produce it within you. But to see the importance of this is amazing. Uh, the first slide on this thing is the definition of, of this self-control. It comes from a word, inkratia, inkratia, or whatever, I can't pronounce it in Greek, but nevertheless, it comes from the word kratos, meaning strength or power. And we, we get the word democracy from that. Yeah, we get that word, the crassy part of there is, this, is the in part, is uh, the power of the people. And so it is, it is power, it's talking about power. It's not, it's not talking about n not having any power, it's talking about having a huge amount of power, but having it under control. Having it under control, and I, I like the little the drawing in the, in the uh, bulletin that Judy put in there where the, the dog is there with his little tail directing him. It's self-control, it's, it's self-guiding, it's, it's I am under control. I have this power that I have inside of me, but it is under solid control is what it's talking about. Uh, the synonyms for that is temperance, restraint, control, self-governance. You are self-governing in this thing. It is, a, <clears throat> it is a powerful tool for us, and we need to see it in contrast with another thing. Self-control is, is, is opposite to akrasia, or no control. Uh, the Greeks, the early Greeks, Socrates, basically, and his three disciples after him, Plato being one of them, came up with this word, or used, it transferred a, a word that was a verb, I think, and made it into a noun, self-control. They turned it into that. It's a powerful tool. And they contrasted to akrasia. Akrasia, what that means, it is the state of performing what is known to be not a positive choice because of its negative consequences, but nevertheless performing it because of its immediate pleasures. So akrasia, a means no, and krasia meaning power. They have no power over themselves. They, what, what it talks about is this immediate gratification that we have in this world of ours today is I can't keep myself from doing immediate gratification for whatever it is, like a person that's addicted to certain things. They can't keep themselves from that. I've got to do that because it's a pleasurable thing, even though it might have a negative result. The drunkard person that's drinking a lot, they can't keep themselves from the alcohol, even though the next morning they know they're going to be in a terrible mess, and they know that the damage is going to be further on down the road, it's going to be worse and worse and worse and worse. They, they ignore that. The person who's smoking says, well, it may not happen to me, but they know that one out of three people are going to die if that smoke. Yeah, you know, that's, that's the, the thing. I, I saw a commercial on a, before a TV or a um, video, and uh, it had these people jumping off a bungee thing and going down and, and picking up a pop, and they open a pop and they drink it going up. And one guy does it, and it's really exciting. Another guy does it, and it's exciting. And the third guy comes in, he does it, goes up, and he explodes. And then it said, and then it says, smoking is the only thing that kills one-third of the people that use it. It's the only product that kills one-third of the people that use it. And you go, that's a pretty powerful message. And yet people do it for the immediate gratification. They, they do it now, knowing that they're, it's dumb, that the result of it can be very, very bad down the road. I'm going to pay the price down the road, but I can't stop myself from doing it. 
and, and of course, addiction's not fair to do this. this addiction is addiction. It's really hard, and, and we come alongside of people that are, and some of us are, are here that have some of those addictions that are, are chemical addictions, and, and we know it's tough. And we come alongside of you and help you accomplish that. And you know that you don't want to keep on doing it, but you're now addicted. But before you get addicted, before you do this thing and that stuff, it's the mindset that I've got to have that immediate pleasure as opposed to what it's going to cost me down the road. And that's the world that we live in now is grab for all the gusto you can get because you only go live once in life. You, you go only once around in life, grab for all the gusto you can get. I remember that's a beer commercial. You know, get it. You know, got to get it, gratify it. Because you're only going to live once. You know, just go ahead and live it shorter than the rest of us. <laughs> but, you know, grab for it. Well, th that, you can see the, that, that word there, uh, akrasia. And then you got an inkratia is uh, the state of performing what is known to be positive, even though it may be tough, it may be hard, it may be difficult, and it may hurt. You, ch you choose that which is a positive choice of not doing something because of its positive consequences of your not doing it. You have self-control. You say, yes, that would be a great thing to have, but I'm going to put it off. I'm going to put it off. Oh, i got to buy this car. Well, wait a second. If I do that, then I'm not going to have money to eat tomorrow. <laughs> you know? So I put it off for the positive consequences. I put off buying the car, which would be immediate gratification of some joy in my heart. And tomorrow I get to eat, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day, I, maybe I can save up money for that car down the road instead of having it now. And of course, that's not what the Madison Avenue people want you to hear. I want to hear us be saying that. They want to buy now, buy now, buy now, buy now. Gratify, gratify, gratify. And you say, wait a second. I've got self-control. God can give me self-control. I can say no to the things that the world is trying to get me involved with. Uh, you know, it's the, the kid that says, well, everybody's doing it. Well, no, everybody that has no control does that. But people that have control approach life with wisdom. And they understand that I put off the immediate in order for a positive result. It is an important virtue for us to have. Uh, the early Greeks, this is before the Bible, uh, before the New Testament, of course, it, <clears throat> this, this guy named uh, Xenophon, that would be a great name to have. Uh, he was a disciple of Socrates. He says, self-control is not a particular virtue, but is the foundation of all virtues. How wise he was, way before Paul writes this fruit of the Spirit, but we come down to the thing is that self-control is essential for all the functioning of the fruit of the Spirit. You have to have self-control to love. You have to have self-control to be gentle. You have to have self-control to do any of the fruit of the Spirit. Even joy. It's self-control. That I have a knowledge that the things that I do are going to have consequences down the road and so I do the things that are going to have positive consequences down the road that's how I'm going to act so whenever I, uh, an individual that is really has hurt me really bad I go to forgiveness why because I have self-control I instead of taking it all on myself and saying this person has hurt me and I'm going to hurt them back that would be gratification of immediate gratification. We say, no, I'm going to choose forgiveness because it's going to have a positive effect down the road. It is required of us. It is essential for us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ to understand that the gifting of the self-control that God gives to us through the power of the Holy Spirit is absolutely essential for us to develop. It has a righteous connection. In Acts 24, 25, it says this, uh, Paul is, is uh, doing this. He says he's before Felix. He's standing before him. He's on trial. And it says this in verse 25. It says, but as he was discussing righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix became frightened and said, go away for the present, and when I find time, I will summon you. Now, why in the world did Felix get frightened? Him talking about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Well, then here's the righteous connection. There is a righteousness. It is required to be, for, to be 
well, that's not good writing there. It is required for us to have eternal life, okay? It's required for us to have eternal life, is this righteousness. It's a righteousness that not is not of the righteousness of human beings, what we can do. It is the very righteousness of God that is required for us to have eternal life. You say, how do you? Oh, my goodness. That is what's required for us to come into the presence of God is the very righteousness of God. And then there is judgment, and it comes to all who lack that righteousness. That's what judgment is. The judgment is, is there. It is of God. And if you do not have the very righteousness of God whenever you go into his presence, then there is going to be this judgment. And so in between those two is self-control. Here's the righteousness of God. Here's the judgment. And here I am. I am called on to have self-control. And that is the reason why Felix was having trouble with it. Felix became frightened. This is the next slide. Felix became convicted that he lacked its self-control and was therefore subject to the judgment. That is the reason why he became frightened. Now, the gospel comes along and helps immensely in this whole thing, but the result of this conviction was the fear of the judgment. And that's where we present, when we're presenting the gospel, that is one of the things that is necessary for people to come to realize, is that because God requires absolute righteousness, I have failed to grab a hold of that through my self ability of controlling myself. I've done that which is evil in God's eyes. Therefore, I am subject to the judgment. Now, the thing is, of course, is there any hope for us at all in that situation? Because no matter how much self-control I might have, I can't do the righteousness of God. I can't do it. But here comes the gospel, and that's what is amazing. In Titus 3.5, it says this, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. So, not that we have done in righteousness, but it is according to his mercy which grants us his righteousness. When I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, is my Savior, I believe the gospel, God considers our faith in his word in what he has said about his son as the very righteousness of God himself. That's what he did with, with uh, Abraham. He believed God and it was credited unto him as righteousness. So also when we believe the gospel, it is credited unto his, us the righteousness, not of our own righteousness, which cannot stand before God, but the very righteousness of God, which comes from, uh, to us on the basis of faith. So there is hope for us. Uh, the power of God, the next slide here, it says the power of God that gives us new life keeps on working within us, renewing and transforming us. So if you remember that verse in Titus 3, 5, he saved us according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So what happens is whenever I come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, at this point in time, I have the righteousness of God, I can go home to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. But I've got a journey still to go. If everybody that believed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ went, <clears throat> every time they believed, God took them home, uh, the gospel would not would go well. <laughs> you know, oh, I don't want to do that. I'm not sure where they went. You know, uh, okay. But, uh, but he lets us stay here upon the face of this earth to win our loved ones, to win the lost, win a proclamation to the world around us that there is a good God in heaven that saves us and has a heart for us, and wants us home. And so then I've got this journey that I've got to go on. And in that journey, God has washed me from my sins, and I step out to be renewed by the Holy Spirit on a daily basis. I become more and more and more like Jesus as I go. That is God's methodology. Now, true, it would be faster and easier for me to go home to be with the Lord Jesus Christ and be instantly transformed. That would be great but it's not so good for the rest of the people left behind. So therefore, we submit to the process that God gives to us to go through this thing to get to the end. I go there because God has done that, because he is doing. Self-control is indeed a fruit of the Spirit. It is what God does in us. Now, we go to the place of saying, okay, I've got the Holy Spirit. I've got, therefore, I have self-control in me. So how do I develop that self-control? How does it become more and more a part of what I do? 
Exercising is no accident. You don't exercise by accident. Did you notice that? I, I've been doing this for a long time. I get up in the morning, I drag myself to the gym, I get there on that machine, and I get on there and I do my thing. And I'm sweating and I'm wet. I, you can't do that by accident. You gotta make a choice. You gotta choose. Now, my body is rebelling right now. <laughs> it does not want to do that anymore. I get on that machine and my body says, no. So I've had to change my, my, my thing and say, well, maybe I'm 66 years old, and maybe I ought to slow down a bit. I had one time I was doing it. I was just on this machine, and this guy comes up and says, how old are you? <laughs> I told him I was, at, at that time I was about 60 years old. He, said, he turned around to everybody else over there, and he says, I told you so. <laughs> I, I have no, <laughs> he's nuts. <laughs> I don't know what they were talking about, but anyway, that was kind of funny. It's no accident. You gotta, you gotta choose to do it. You gotta choose to be, have self-control. Or if you do not control yourself, somebody else is going to. And I know somebody that is an enemy of our soul that wants to control you very well. And so if you're not busy learning to control yourself, then you're gonna fall into a hole. And it's gonna be a bad hole that you fall into. So you need to learn how to exercise self-control. Here's the passage of scripture that we're gonna find out, 1 Corinthians 9. It says, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. And then he comes on and says, everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So he says, everybody that wants to run this race, you're going to have to exercise yourself. And self-control is one of the Chief things that we need to learn how to act, use to accomplish this. So then we need to do that. So that's the, therefore, let's do it. Let's go about exercising self-control. He says, uh, in verse on, going on, it says this, Therefore I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. But I discipline my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. I love that passage of scripture, especially, and there's another version that says, but I buffet my body. Oh, no, 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 it's buffet my body. <laughs> buffet. Ah, okay. But I discipline, I buff buffet my body. I, I make it my slave. How do you do that? That's self-control. I make my body do what it needs to do. I need to make my body... Okay, I need forgiveness. I know God's convicting me that I need to convict and use forgiveness in my life. So I make myself be obedient. One time I, I was reading uh, The Normal Christian Life. I could not read it. I bought it uh, as a young Christian. I heard it was a good book, so I started reading it. I could not understand a word it said. Two years later, I, I just put it aside. I couldn't understand it. Uh, so I, I, I put it aside, and then two years later, I got, picked it back up and said, I've got to read this book. I started reading it, didn't understand it. But I said, I want to know what's in this book. So what I did is I forced myself to read it out loud. By the second chapter, it finally was sinking into me, and I started learning from it. It was an amazing book. It was transformational. So I disciplined myself to do that which I knew that I needed to do. And that's what, we, what he says for us to do. Let's, hey, let's do what we need to do. Let's exercise. Let's exercise and do that with a conscious effort to put ourselves into the place where we are under self-control, that this immediate gratification is kicked out of the way. I don't care what the immediate gratification is. I look to the long-term goals and the long-term benefits, and I do what is necessary to get the long-term benefits. It is a powerful tool for us to accomplish. It is all part of the mix, is the next slide. Now, for this very reason, also applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and your moral excellence, knowledge. And in your knowledge, self-control. Okay? In your knowledge, self-control. Out of the knowledge that you read out of the scripture, we need to apply self-control. Why? Because I need to apply it in my life. If I find something in the scripture that I, I need to follow, it's like James says, the scriptures are like a mirror. When I look in the mirror and it says my 
here is messy, I supposedly you know, try to make it unmessy. Uh, you'll have to decide whether I succeed at that or not. But nevertheless, that's what I do. And so I look at the mirror of the word, and I look and see, and I see there's some transformational things that are necessary in my life, so then I exercise self-control. I grab a hold of that knowledge, and I say, this has got to be applied to my life, and so I start doing that. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> somebody, oh, I know it was, it, it was uh, Mary Brett. She said that a lot of people have trouble with St. Mattress. You know, on Sunday morning, St. Mattress gets them. And so they're, they're, they, they say, and so they get convicted. Okay, I need to get involved. It says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as a habit of some, but encourage one another as all the more you see the day drawing near. So why do we come to church? It is because God motivates us in order that we might be here to encourage one another, build up one another, strengthen one another. And you're missing all that if you're not committed to being a part of the body of Christ. I, I need to be involved with him in the word of God. So I need to get in small groups. Okay, that, that's going to take discipline. I've got to find the time to get into a small group. I've got to find a small group. I've got to do this. And get involved with that and start learning and growing in Christ. I've got to pray. I've got to get involved with prayer, not only by myself, but I need to get involved with other people to get praying. So get involved with the, the, the prayer chain, whatever it may be that God is leading us to do to accomplish this. I need to exercise self-control to do that, or else I'm going to be out there just not growing in Christ. And it's absolutely essential that I grow in Christ. I don't want for you, I don't want for me, I don't want for anybody to get to that last day and shrink away from in shame, but I don't want also to have such a gap between me and my Lord that I'm, I gotta, God's got to do major, major work to get me to be like Jesus. I know it says I'm going to be transformed into the image of Jesus because we'll see him just as he is, but I'd like for it to be a short transition because God has done his work in me life as I've gone down the path that he has given me to live, I want to, be as, I want to be as close to Jesus as I possibly can. I want to encourage my brothers and sisters in Christ to do the very same thing. And the way we do that is through self-control. We do it self-control-wise. He says, uh, and in your self-control, perseverance. I got, how are you going to do it? Stick with it. And in your perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, love. These are the things that God wants us to do with this stuff, is get there and be accomplished there. We want to stay useful, for we want to stay useful. In 1 Peter 1.8, it says this, For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you begin your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, many times your growth at the very beginning is, seems phenomenal. I know that happened to me. I mean, it's just like, oh. Three years into, the, into my faith in Christ, I was a totally different person than I was three years before. And I looked at all around all the brothers and sisters in Christ in that church that I was in. It was, it was a larger church. And uh, I was wondering, man, some people I talked to, they've been in Christ for 30 years. I was, what would it be like to be with Christ? Years. And then I looked at their life and I said, oh, they're not much more mature than I am. What happened? They didn't increase. It takes self-discipline to increase so that's what we do is we say okay not only do i need self-discipline to get past the things in my my life that i was doing before i came to christ okay i exercise self-control in that area but i need to keep on exercising self-control in the areas that god has in front of me stay useful stay growing stay maturing grow in the grace and knowledge of the lord jesus christ from birth until death we're not done. I think it was somebody <laughs> in our congregation that says, I wish there was a vacation for Christians. You know, be, I, can, I can stop being, being a Christian for a little bit. You know, have a little vacation from this growing stuff. No, nope, there's no... no yeah, yeah. Do you ask a tree, you know, are you done growing for a while? Well, yeah, during the winter when nothing's going on. <laughs> I look like I'm dead, don't I? All right. Well, no, the tree is actually growing. You don't see it. It's way down underneath. It's establishing itself. It's growing some more roots. It's, you can't see it growing. On the outside, it looks like it's dead, but he's still growing. And that's what we are as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Even when things don't seem to be going on, God is causing the growth. Get involved with self-discipline, self-control 
to get these things established in your heart and your soul. So stay the distance. Be long-sighted. For he who lacks these qualities is blind and short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. So be long-sighted rather than short-sighted. And then he says in 1 Peter 1.10, it says, Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing of you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. And then, for in this way, this is verse 11, for in this way, the entrance to the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. Okay. All right. That is the foundational stuff. There's a whole lot more stuff that I can teach about self-control. We talk about putting off the old and putting on the new. All right. That's good stuff. Do that. Start learning. God, what are the tools that I need to develop this tool of self-control? And recognize those things that are in your life that are keeping you from exercising that self-control. What is it that gets you? Whatever draws you into it and keeps you from furthering your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there is a place for recreation. Even Jesus went away from the crowds. So there is a place. You know, you don't say, I've got to keep on doing, 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 doing. That is not what we're talking about here. We're not trying to get you to become, become maniacs about doing things. We're talking about being wise and sometimes being separated and being quiet and not doing a whole bunch of stuff is more important than being doing stuff. So you live a balanced life. And a lot of time when I'm preaching, it might sound like I got to do all this stuff, but you got to remember it, it's I'm, I'm preaching in extremes. <laughs> I can't cover everything at the same time, but you balance yourself. You balance yourself. It's always a balance and always there. But I, I got this thing in my mind. I'm going to be like Jesus. I want to walk with Jesus. I've got to discipline myself to follow him with all of my heart and with all my soul. That is what God has called me to do. And that's what I'm going to do. And so self-control, uh, it's amazing. It's the very, very best way to go, as the old song says. Self-control, it's the very best way to go. Use that self-control. And I'm going to control myself and stop talking. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the blessings and the encouragement that we have in your word, that you may strengthen through your word these things into our lives and that we might, might understand that these things, that all these things that I've talked about so far are ours in Christ and we have them. It's just sometimes they're instead of being the fruit of the spirit, they're just kind of little dried up raisins and we need to plump them up. And so, Father, I pray that you'll plump them up in our lives that we might be able to walk in love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and self-control and uh, goodness, oh Father, just give it, give us that ability to do that, and the body of Christ will grow and mature, that we might be able to strengthen those who you draw to yourself, and that we might see you do a mighty work in our lives, and glorify yourself in the process, that we might be able to see Jesus today. Father, there may be somebody here that doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, and desperately need to have you. And they may wonder, how do I start this journey? And the journey starts in believing the gospel, the good news that Jesus came into this world, that he took upon himself our sins, that he died on the cross, and he rose again from the dead for our justification. And he ascended into heaven, and that we're going to go back to be with him. And that's the simplicity of the, of the gospel, Lord. And they need to just believe your message, that Jesus died for us. And that they do that. And say it's just a simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I need you. I open the door of my life and receive you as my personal Savior and Lord. I repent of my sins. I turn away from that life. And I turn to the new life that you have. Make me the person you want me to be. Teach me self-control. Teach me love. Teach me peace. Teach me joy. That I might glorify you with my life. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.